good good morning or good afternoon and welcome to this webinar on quality of DEXA services, result of a global survey by IOF and ISCD and other joint initiatives. I'm Dominique Pierrot, Science Manager at IOF, and I'm happy to moderate this webinar. Uh, before uh, introducing the speaker, the two speakers of the day, I would like to inform you that attendees are automatically muted. And I also would like to encourage you to ask questions during the webinar by typing your questions in the question box of the control panel. I will voice the questions to the speakers towards the end of the webinar. This being said, I'm happy to, in to let the mic to Professor Cyrus Cooper, who will introduce himself and who will introduce Professor Christopher Schuhart. Thank you very much indeed, um, Dominique. Uh, so good morning, uh, good afternoon, good evening, uh, colleagues uh, uh, globally. It's a real pleasure to um, uh, give this webinar with um, Chris Schuhart. Uh, Christopher is a family practitioner and director of the Metabolic Bone uh, Unit at the Swedish Medical Group in Seattle. And uh, I, of course, uh, present as president of the International Osteoporosis Foundation. I'm a rheumatologist and epidemiologist from the United Kingdom. Um, and we're departing from uh, our usual single themed webinar um, program today to give you an update on the many areas in which um, IOF and the International Society for Clinical Densitometry, ISCD, uh, have collaborated um, in recent years. The centerpiece will be a um, study of, um, of, of DEXA services worldwide that uh, Christopher and Bill Leslie. Uh, from ISCD's part and myself and a team at IOF and here at Southampton um, undertook over the last three years and which was published just a few months ago in Osteoporosis International. Uh, Chris will then cover uh, Osteoporosis Essentials, the course that we jointly run uh, between the two organizations. We'll then have here a continuation into a scientific overview of ISCD's activities and then I will close with a scientific overview of some of the highlights at the, uh, at the foundation, at the International Osteoporosis Foundation. So then let's move to the um, worldwide DXA survey. And uh, this was a manuscript um, pulled together at our unit by Michael Kleins and Leo Westbury. And I must pay tribute to Bill Leslie and Chris Schuhart at the ISCD end, and of course the home team in Neon, um, led by Dominique Guerrero and uh, Masaki Fujita, who undertook the liaison between the questionnaire on DXA services and our Capture the Fracture uh, network. So the background is that, as you know, osteoporosis is a major public health problem. Fractures are associated with disability and mortality. Um, DXA is an important determinant of the risk of fracture, but despite its widespread adoption worldwide in this risk assessment uh, methodology, um, DXA quality at various facilities around the world has not been the subject of rigorous study. So the objectives of this particular um, study were to conduct a global survey of fracture liaison services uh, that participated in Capture the Fracture and to assess the access to and quality of their DXA facilities. And you're well aware that the Capture the Fracture initiative uh, maps out as an anthology uh, various FLSs globally, and there are now um, over 400 of these recorded the time at which we undertook the study, uh, there were just uh, approaching 300. The survey tool was developed uh, by uh, the colleagues at ISCD and then refined in discussion with our executive committee at uh, IOF. The survey was used uh, with experience uh, of the facility accreditation program at ISCD Content was assisted uh, by uh, referral to the Osteoporosis Essentials course, 
and the ISCD established official positions and best practice uh, reports, uh, more of which you will hear about from Chris uh, later on in the webinar. The um, SLS is participating, were invited to complete the survey. This was distributed using a survey monkey, and from the 331 invitees, we had responses that were full in 121 actual liaison services. In three, there was um, just entry to the questionnaire without completion, and it's the data from these 121 uh, that I'm going to um, map out for you today, and which, uh, which uh, were the subject of the manuscript, as I said, published in Osteoporosis International. What were the questions that we asked? First, the questions to the FLS contact, and second, the set of questions to the uh, DXA service provider. So for the FLS contact, we, uh, contact, we asked about the characteristics of the FLS and associated DXA service, guidelines for DXA access, the frequency of DXA use in each patient, the use in risk assessment and treatment monitoring, the quality of the service and reporting, its accreditation by professional or governmental organizations, and its incorporation within a continuing education program and an SOP manual. For the service provider, uh, we have um, three uh, sets of questions. The first looked at machine calibration with the Phantom, the frequency of review for drift, numerical quality assurance rules to determine acceptable performance, manufacturer's SOP manuals immediately available in the suite in print or electronic form, and the use of standardized questionnaires to gather clinical information about patients. So the uh, next set, uh, components of the DXA questionnaire were inquired about, including indications for the scan, clinical risk factors for fracture risk estimation, the history or present use of bone detrimental medications, fracture history, treatment with osteoporosis therapies, and um, whether a questionnaire was or was not used at all. We found out about the primary source for collection of DXA questionnaire responses, the assessment of significant BMD change in individuals over time, the reporting of least significant change at the 95% significance level, the lumbar spine and total hip BMD, and quantitative fracture risk instruments uh, used for the reporting of DXA. And then in the third of the service provider categories, we inquired about the reporting of body site measurements, region of interest, and side for each valid BMD. Uh, the information on scanner manufacturer and model uh, it within the report, the content of technical adequacy of the report and limitations of the study, the commenting of differences in standard acquisition modes and analysis parameters. And lastly, the recommendation within the report on repeat scan intervals. The full questionnaire is provided in the appendix to the manuscript and uh, the full results are also presented there, but in the time we have available today, I'll give you some of the important findings. So here is the uh, mapping of the uh, countries, the 31 countries within which the fracture liaison services were located in the sample that we studied. Clearly, and as you'll see reflected in our IOF general constitution, we're only just beginning to make inroads into sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, there was a concentration of effort and response within Europe, um, Oceania, North America, and Latin America. Now some of the results. So the first one here, the proportion of time that DXA access met service needs and scan reporting quality was described uh, as a uh, of excellent quality. But here in these reports, the proportions were really pretty, pretty much the majority. 74%, sorry, 71% of our respondents uh, said that DXA access met service needs at greater than the 90th percentile, and 74% that scanning and reporting quality was excellent at the same threshold. So generally, a pretty positive overall report 
of both service provision uh, being met and the service need being met and a scan report quality uh, being excellent. Next, let's go to the frequency of phantom calibration and reviewing of phantom values. Here, the result was much more patchy and the whole issue of machine calibration is really rather important. In only 37 of the, of the, of the centers, 35% overall, was their machine calibration using a phantom undertaken on most days of the week. And in only a further 6% did it occur on two to three times a week and a further 9% uh, weekly. So that in uh, the sort of 50th, you know, in 50% of the, of the, of the um, participating centers, we had either no knowledge of calibration or it was undertaken at less than weekly intervals. And phantom values uh, were plotted and reviewed for shifts and drift, again, uh, four to five uh, times or more each week in only 23% of the centers. And you can see the uh, unknown responses there being greater than 40% again. So work to be done on um, calibration using phantoms and drift in measurements over time. Going to the next, the portion of time that a standardized questionnaire was used to gather clinical patient information. Well, that was 60% uh, in the vast majority of, uh, of patients studied um, for, for, for the center. So that was really pretty good with only one in five, the 20 there, 19% uh, giving not applicable, 7% don't know, and 5% uh, really doing uh, questionnaires very infrequently. Next, the method for assessing significant change in BMD over time. So 44%, um, that's 47 respondents, uh, used the least significant change at a P of 0.05. Um, Manufacturers' recommendations were used in a further 15% and determined by the DXA interpreter was responded to as 18%. So again, a substantial number of centers not really using um, the least significant change approach. Uh, and if we go to the units in which least significant change was reported, the spine in the top and the total hip at the bottom, we found that either grams per centimetre squared percentage or both of these were used in about 60% of the lumbar spine and a similar proportion of the proximal femur uh, measurements uh, amongst the centres, with, uh, as you can see there, the remainder uh, not really reporting either, and the balance between absolute and proportionate um, least significant change reporting was about 50-50. So that's just a brief overview of a much more detailed survey that really represents the first such evaluation of its kind worldwide and was opportunistically using the uh, registration system of fracture liaison services that we have within Capture the Fracture. We'd love to extend the work to um, other uh, sort of global um, sets of, uh, of centers, uh, but it does provide us with an important benchmarking for future work, as well as concluding that most fracture liaison services reported that their DXA access met their clinical needs. In over half of these services, Education is clearly required for the operators and the interpreters of the scan in terms of the optimization of the service. And uh, a similar proportion didn't confirm adherence to some pretty basic DXA quality and reporting procedures. And there's high variability in these, uh, both in terms of quality and access worldwide. As you drill down to the size of the centers and their geographic location, one can see. Uh, that there are areas in which we can improve circumstances. And the main ways in which we wish to, to do that is by establishing Capture the Fracture standards for DXA quality. And in our um, key performance indicators that were published just earlier this year by Kasim Javed, uh, we make a start to incorporate that within a variety of other KPIs. And the second important strategy to reduce variability 
which is a segue into the next part of this webinar, is really to use the education initiatives that we've pioneered with ISCD, for example, the Osteoporosis Essentials course, which can really be targeted to enhance uh, and optimize the quality of DXA measurement and reporting. So that's the first um, part of our webinar. Let's now move on to that description of the Osteoporosis Essentials course, uh, Chris. Thank you, Cyrus, and greetings to everyone from around around the world, morning, noon, or evening. I'm uh, Chris Schuhart, uh, Media Past President of ISCD, and I'm pleased to be able to discuss with you some information on the Osteoporosis Essentials course and its routine updating, some of the new contents um, related to recent ISCD scientific endeavors, and then I'll discuss with you those uh, endeavors in, in detail. Um, uh, really regarding the ISCD's Position Development Conference in 2019 in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. And last, I'll transfer back to Cyrus after I discuss some of the um, initiatives that are uh, joint initiatives between IOF, ISCD, and other partners around the world. You can go ahead and advance, please, Cyrus. So the uh, Osteoporosis Essentials training course has been a collaboration between ISCD and IOF since 2010. Um, you may recall that uh, back in 2010, this uh, scientific collaboration really kicked off in earnest when uh, the ISCD and IS uh, IOF created joint positions on FRACs. Um, since then, um, uh, our course materials have been uh, adopted and, and modified uh, jointly with uh, IOF to create the Osteoporosis Essentials training course which had its most recent update early in 2020. Of course, the focus of these courses is on best patient outcome uh, and quality densitometry, as uh, Cyrus has already alluded to. Uh, largely, the questionnaire um, is based on um, the understanding of uh, quality uh, application of densitometry for patients. Um, there are popular um, additional um, modules inside of the osteoporosis essentials course for uh, osteoporosis treatment and uh, we continue to update those as well those won't be so much the focus of this talk um, we uh, iof and icd provide these course materials worldwide and we'll have a little data later on on uh, 2019 activity in that regard next slide please cyrus if you could advance please cyrus yeah I'm trying to, I'm afraid yeah. it's not working. Dominique, can you advance perhaps? I'm, I'm really sorry. That's okay. Uh, there we you. go. Okay, thank you so much. So um, I'm going to be just highlighting a couple of areas of the many areas that have been updated in the Osteoporosis Essentials course for 2020, and the first of which is a, a suite of um, new information for uh, bone health in orthopedic patients. Um, we were uh, we undertook this area as as a collaboration with our orthopedic colleagues for the PDC in 2019, and really focused on general orthopedic patients, periprosthetic orthopedic patients, and spinal orthopedic patients. We developed uh, positions that have been incorporated into uh, the clinical aspects of OE for clinical both bone health assessment in orthopedic patients. The use of DXA in orthopedic patients and the use of, of, of vertebral fracture assessment or VFA in orthopedic patients. Uh, the material also goes on to help uh, orthopedists and other practitioners understand what is a high risk orthopedic patient in terms of risk for uh, bone complications related to bone strength, um, tools to identify uh, those patients, and some specifics on uh, particular types of orthopedic patients and orthopedic classification uh, of patients with, for instance, uh, hip or knee replacement, and how that might uh, those categories of patients might put patients at additional risk. We also have included some new information in a developing area that I think is quite exciting, and that is the use of CT-based attenuation calculations with Hounsfield units uh, at the lumbar spine to estimate the probability 
of osteoporosis. Um, this is an area that I think is growing relatively rapidly, is simple and, and very effective uh, and, and very accessible even without DXA at times. Next slide, please. A second area of advancement in the OE course is new information that came out of the 2019 ISCD PDC regarding patients with chronic spinal cord injury. Some of the information that we've included um, helps clinicians understand some of the distinguishing features of bone loss and fractures related to patients with uh, spinal cord injury, which is very different from the paradigm that we're used to for patients, say, with postmenopausal osteoporosis. We include in OE um, indications for the performance of densitometry in patients with uh, spinal cord injury and uh, for both for standard DXA and for other um, advancing forms of densitometry, advancing regional densitometry that looks like it will better predict the risk for fractures in these types of patients. These um, techniques and the reference database that's available is not widely available yet, but it's very clear that the spinal cord community is committed to expanding the access to the database, growing the database for spinal cord injured patients, and uh, promulgating the techniques for the specific regional bone density measurements. So stay tuned with that. The literature will continue to evolve and the science will continue to evolve. Lastly, we include information from the PDC regarding um, uh, uh, no, no floor for a bone density measurement below which a patient with spinal cord injury should have rehabilitation. Uh, there is no um, um, unsafe limit for bone density for patients undergoing weight-bearing rehabilitation with spinal cord injury, and that's included in the OE. Next slide, please, Cyrus. The last area that uh, we've heard at ISCD for many years um, our, our colleagues would like advice on is in the area of transgender and gender non-conforming uh, bone health assessment. In OE, we uh, outline indications for baseline bone mineral density testing that include the standard indications that most of us are used to, but also include indications related to hypogonadal states in TGNC patients and for those who are hypogonadal without gender affirming therapy. Furthermore, we discuss monitoring BMD only when results matter. It's a pretty standard paradigm that you've heard and we'll heard it here again or when there are changes in the patient's milieu, like changes in hormone therapy, uh, questions about adherence to medication, or apparent or perceived non-response to treatment. Uh, there's a recommendation that's forwarded from the PDC to report T-scores according to the standard ISCD criteria using the uniform female Caucasian reference database. Uh, that's no change from uh, previous, but is uh, adopted for this group of patients. We recommend using the WHO criteria according to uh, previous guidelines. Z-scores should be reported according to the, uh, the, the declared gender identity of the patient. The Z-scores of the birth sex may be reported if requested by the ordering provider. Go ahead, Cyrus, please. So just to recap the spread uh, worldwide of these materials through the osteoporosis essentials course, in 2019, of course, before the pandemic, uh, 21 courses were held in 12 different countries and five continents globally. Uh, you can see the, uh, the countries there that uh, really are quite impressive, particularly when you understand that more than 1,100 attendees uh, have um, been able to work with this material. Uh, and, and of course, that's the 2019 material. There's a brand new set uh, of updated materials for 2020. There was an independent um, OE course supported by Zueleg uh, in Malaysia with an additional 36 attendees. So now I'd like to just review briefly the 2019 PDC and its influence, I think, uh, in, uh, on the uh, bone health community. This is going to be an overview and I won't be directly quoting the ISCD official positions, the best place to find the actual text of the official positions is in the executive summary that uh, you see cited here or at the ISCD website uh, at iscd.org under the tab that's called learn. 
um, this may be linked on the IOF website and maybe Dominique or someone else can provide some information on that later on. Um, so our position topic areas, we typically uh, undertake topics um, that uh, are uh, forwarded to the, to the committee for PDC based on a standard and fairly involved process of vetting, voting, and narrowing. This year we came up with, well, 2019, we came up with 34 positions in a number of different areas. In the upper right of the pie chart, you'll see a general area that we refer to as our monitoring area. Uh, we had four positions in monitoring of BMD. We had one position each for monitoring of VFA and TBS. We had three positions in the uh, developing and exciting field of uh, monitoring a typical monitoring for a typical femur fracture. We then had an additional four positions each for our transgender and gender non-conforming topics, four positions for cross calibration and LSC issues, and then at the upper left, seven positions for our orthopedic colleagues and orthopedic patients, four positions for spinal cord injury, and unique this year or excuse me, in 2019, we combined a pediatric uh, position development conference with our adult position development conference, and we forwarded seven new positions for our pediatric colleagues. Next slide, please. So what I'll be um, going over here are simply overviews of the stated positions, not the stated positions themselves. And the, the first uh, area, it, and, and really the most familiar to, to uh, uh, bone health practitioners is BMD monitoring. So new advice on BMD monitoring uh, is that serial bone mineral density testing for monitoring is really only a part of the clinical decision making regarding initiating treatment for patients. Uh, other factors could include things like bone turnover markers, fracture history, height loss, presence or absence of vertebral fracture, etc. But it is an important part, of course. And serial BMD should be part of ongoing assessment after treatment is stopped to monitor patients for declining BMD and the potential need to restart treatment or reconsider treatment. It may seem obvious, but serial BMD points to the potential for treatment effectiveness, ineffectiveness, potential secondary causes of osteoporosis, and the need to reevaluate the present regimen. Bone mineral density uh, repeat testing should only be performed when the results will alter management. And a, a new recommendation that uh, at ISCD, uh, I think is something that we live and breathe, and is that a patient should return to the same DXA device for serial measuring, provided that least significant change values are known and acceptable uh, to the clinician who's managing the patient. Next slide, please, sorry. In the topic uh, area of cross calibration and similar of uh, similar DXA devices, um, we uh, created a couple of positions um, related to cross calibration. This is one of them that particularly relates to um, calibration of devices that are similar to each other. And the text of the cited paper can help you understand the differences between similar devices and dissimilar devices. We undertook this because we see in the United States, and I think it's happening around the world, an increasing prevalence of bone density being performed in facilities versus clinics or uh, physician offices, that is in radiology facilities. And so to help in the ability for patients to move across machines within a system, we, cre we did research to be able to create a, a, a position that allows calibration between similar machines not using in vivo cross calibration, not using people. So we, we, we recommend that when machines are similar that you use a technique, uh, an in vitro technique that uses phantom spine calibration that is a hub and spoke model with, a, with um, machines being tied to the calibration of a central machine. And after going through the process, if any machine is plus or minus 0.5% deviating from the hub machine, that your representatives from manufacturers be contacted to adjust the calibrations of the machines. And it's also noted that using this process does not address the issue of how to apply least significant change across different machines. Next slide, please, sorry. Detection of atypical femur fracture or incipient or uh, early atypical femur fracture is uh, an important aspect of clinical care that 
densitometry with new technology, fortunately, uh, has advanced. And so Angela Chung and the subunit of BMD monitoring team shown here did a great job uh, creating for us some positions that help us understand how to use that functionality in our DEXA machines for full femur imaging. So it, 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 it feels like, although we don't have a lot of data yet, that full femur imaging can improve patient safety. Most late generation DEXA machines have full femur imaging available. Those images are extremely fast, 20 to 30 seconds per femur of the patient. Low energy, um, low dose, single energy images, and the images are quite crisp. Um, the recommendations that are forwarded from the team um, in the form of uh, official positions are to first make sure that standard DXA images of the hip are reviewed for abnormalities in the spectrum of atypical femur fracture and discussion in the paper uh, regarding uh, how to do that, um, what to look for in any image uh, is given. Uh, if you are going to perform full femur images, you should also you should always perform bilateral images since the concordance of contralateral uh, incomplete fracture is relatively high. And the criteria essentially are that patients who have been treated with anti-resorptive therapy for three or more years with less than a one-year break in therapy should receive full femur imaging um, when it is available. The reporting should contain information on focal cortical thickening on the lateral cortex, uh, and if any lucency uh, is seen in the image. It's also noted in the paper that uh, advanced imaging is often required in these patients to further delineate the presence or absence of fracture, the presence of a marrow response, and to help guide the clinician as to next steps. Next slide, please, Cyrus. This is just a brief case that uh, came up in our clinic last month of an 87-year-old woman who had taken denosumab for four years. She came in for her routine densitometry. She had a nice response to her denosumab. She had a history of multiple vertebral fractures in the past before starting denosumab. The central image is the initial left femur image. Uh, the arrow points to a, 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 a relatively difficult area to see in this size of an image of cortical thickening and what looks like some endocortical changes in the lateral aspect of the proximal third of the femur. The enlargement in the left picture shows the cortical thickening, the a little bit of an endocortical spike, um, and no evidence of a lucent line. On the right, the image that you can see at the upper third of the femur, um, the left femur shows, uh, it's a little difficult to see, but there's a little black line um, with uh, no evidence of, of edema in the bone marrow. This patient had uh, a, uh, a typical incomplete femur fracture, She's been treated very conservatively with discontinuation of medication and uh, partial weight-bearing status, and we're monitoring her serially because she had no bone marrow edema, um, and her follow-up scan shows no improvement, but no worsening. Next slide, please, Sars. Some additional areas that were covered in the PDC that I did not mention today, uh, according to the, the, the pie graph, are advice uh, for, on monitoring with vertebral fracture assessment, advice on monitoring with trabecular bone score, and pediatric uses of VFA 33% radius bone mineral density, which is new, proximal femur bone mineral density, which is new for pediatric patients, and the advancing field, particularly in non-weight-bearing patients with cerebral palsy, uh, other neurological or orthopedic conditions of the lateral distal femur scan as uh, uh, an important uh, tool in understanding both diagnosis and monitoring for pediatric patients. Go ahead, Cyrus. So now a, a brief discussion of worldwide collaborations with IOF and ISCD, which of course, as I stated, began in 2010 with the joint agreement and our joint positions on FRACs. Most recently, IOF, ISCD, and the Asian Federation of Osteoporosis Societies have joined together to create the Asia Pacific Tripartite Alliance, or just the Tripartite Alliance for short. The mission of which is to promote regional excellence in osteoporosis care and research, and also to promote public awareness in the Asia Pacific region. This uh, organization, this tripartite group, 
got its uh, inception at the Asian Federation of Osteoporosis Societies meeting or AFOS in 2017. And it was launched at the IOF regional meeting in Sydney in November, 2018. In 2019, the uh, Tripartite Alliance was quite active providing information about its uh, activities and opportunities, as well as its uh, mission and, um, and vision at a plenary session for the AFOS meeting in Manila in 2019, and also at a plenary session for the IOF regional meeting in Bangkok 2019. The Tripartite Alliance looks forward to continuing um, its activities when those are possible um, in the setting of um, meetings and other events. A second area of collaboration is the Asia Pacific Fragility Fracture Alliance that was formed more recently, no, late November of 2018. It is a more of an umbrella organization with seven global and regional member organizations, which include ISCD and IOF, and a number of, um, of organizations representing geriatrics, orthopedics, osteoporosis, and rehabilitation sectors in the Asia Pacific region. The purpose of this um, collaboration is to drive policy change and improve um, local and regional awareness of fragility fractures and to change political and professional mindsets, facilitating optimal fragility fracture management in the Asia Pacific region. The vision of the APFFA is to deliver effective care, fewer fractures, and better outcomes for people living in Asia Pacific. And I'll let you know that that's a paraphrasia of uh, the, the um, mission and vision that you can find on, on their website. Next slide. Thank you, Cyrus. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chris. And um, I have to say, just before sort of closing out with an update for the uh, listeners on um, the IOF's uh, activities recently, it has been really helpful to have that anthology of what's been going on, um, not just with the Essentials collaboration, but with um, with ISCD's activities overall. And to be honest, I've got so many questions uh, I could ask about the various PDCs and so on, which if there's a moment at the end, uh, we might be able to discuss. But thank you very much. It, it, breaking out to having a more overview uh, approach to a webinar of this sort is actually periodically really quite helpful. So just from the point of view of the um, IOF uh, component uh, of, of, of the work, uh, you're well aware that um, we cover something like 83% of the uh, global population. The Committee of National Societies now has 260 members under the um, expert uh, chairing of Shonev Regenstair, and uh, they're in 102 locations around uh, countries around the world. You can see the predominance of Europe and the wish to extend further. As I intimated, we're just hoping to have a greater presence in Sub-Saharan Africa over the next uh, few years. Uh, but you can see there the Middle East and North Africa, Asia Pacific and uh, Oceania, um, North America and Latin America components in terms of um, national societies. In terms of the Committee of Scientific Advisors, there are 117 full members and 47 corresponding members um, across the world. And again, uh, the, the global fraternity is really well represented um, and that distribution has improved over the last uh, five to ten years. Our key objective here is to make sure that the next generation of young clinical scientists and um, uh, sort of scientists involved in metabolic bone disease uh, with a clinical bias uh, can be represented uh, as we move forward. <laughs> The Foundation um, manages three journals, Osteoporosis International, under the joint um, editors-in-chief, uh, John Canis and Felicia Cosman. Classified Tissue International, uh, under René Ritzley and Stuart Ralston, and the Archives of Osteoporosis, under uh, John and Felicia again. Uh, of these three, the most important departures have been the incorporation of sarcopenia uh, with Roger Fielding assisting René and Stuart, and that has been a, uh, at Calcified Tissue International, and that's been a real boost, as you can see there, to the impact factor uh, uh, of, of that journal, which is up at 3.522 over the last quinquennium. 
and uh, Osteoporosis International continues its mission, but it's been supplemented by the online-only archives, which, as you can see, uh, has not only achieved listing very rapidly after its inception, but has also got a rising impact factor with some extremely highly cited papers within it. Um, these Bonecast webinars have included um, a, 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 a glittering array of speakers from around the world that are shown there. They're hosted by our CSA membership. Um, there have been nine sessions since January of this year, and they proved really quite popular over the um, uh, over the lockdown period of, of the pandemic. Uh, there's a, an accumulated total of more than 4,000 registrants and um, several, as you can see there, replays. We've just uh, re-commissioned uh, the osteoporosis risk check, uh, an easy to use awareness tool that followed a previous highly um, logged into part of our website uh, over the years. Um, the work's been conducted in association with the National Osteoporosis Foundation. Um, personal risk factors can be um, reviewed in that section of the risk check. Eight key questions with text and icons and um, a printable risk check version and an infographic with a summary of the risk factors that's available in 36 languages uh, that um, physicians can use and uh, discuss risks and benefits of treatment and likelihood of future fracture with their patients. Um, we've uh, recently seen the drawing together under the chairmanship of John Canis with Eugene McCluskey and Nick Harvey, our Scope 2 initiative. You'll recall that in 2013, in two giant editions of the archives, um, we had the European burden of osteoporosis um, covered for the, uh, for the EU27 um, societies uh, the, the, uh, and, and countries. That was updated uh, last year with publication of the big six being repeated. And in this scope two publication, we've uh, gone to look at um, burden and primary and secondary prevention of fractures um, throughout uh, the uh, European countries again, with a scorecard questionnaire on indicators that include fracture registries, patient organizations, and osteoporosis as a national health priority and quality indicators. And upon uh, completion of that manuscript and publication, I think it would make an excellent um, future webinar on its own. We've rebranded the skeletal rare disease initiative as an academy and it's under the chair of uh, Maria Luisa Brandy with uh, the CSA chair Nick Harvey. Uh, it's uh, led wonderfully with their senior team, Kassim Javed, Serge Ferrari, Roland Chapelat and Manju Chandran and uh, it encompasses um, both education and research within the skeletal rare disease arena. They had an Academy Award ceremony at the Summer World Congress virtual, at which um, prizes were given for their um, key uh, award-winning extracts. Training courses will be held in different cities worldwide. An e-learning um, facility will be undertaken uh, with an online exam, and there'll be the um, usual array of um, specific publications communication campaign on Rare Disease Day to um, complement the work that we do on World Osteoporosis Day and educational resources available on the website. Uh, the new website has been launched. Please feel free to go there and utilize it, osteoporosis.foundation, and it's got entry points for health professionals, policymakers, patients, uh, and um, it, it, it's, it's, it's much easier to navigate than the old one. And of course, probably the high, high point of activity over the last six months has been the Capture the Fracture Partnership, which is a, a major worldwide initiative uh, undertaken by uh, the IOF, the University of Oxford, in collaboration with corporate partners at Amgen and UCB. Um, five key components in which we wish to transform the um, post-fracture care landscape with 25% reductions in hip and vertebral fracture and uh, commensurate increases in the provision of post-fracture care 
integrated care systems worldwide. Components include mentorship, um, the influencing of policy, for which there'll be release of a generic policy um, document uh, before the end of the year or early next year. The assembly of uh, coalitions in key countries within the partnership uh, around the globe uh, of key opinion leaders coming together with IOF staff and um, as, uh, members of our corporate partnership uh, looking at how a coalition of clinical activity can be used to leverage uh, influence on policy. Scalable solutions, which includes development of, of uh, a terrific uh, benefit calculator under the um, uh, leadership of Kasim Javed and Rafael uh, Pinedo Villanueva, uh, which calculates the um, health impact and economic consequences of instatement of those fracture care systems using a very thorough uh, literature review-based uh, systematic entry of data. And lastly, digital tools to take forward the current mapping of FLS services worldwide to the level of individual patients and physicians to provide a generic um, platform on which patient um, information can be uh, held and utilized for all of the different uh, member countries. So that's in its first year since inception and is progressing really quite well and will also be the basis uh, for a future communication. So there we have it. Do join us at next year's meeting in London in August and our future congresses in Berlin and Barcelona. But other than that, thank you very much indeed for your time. And I'll pass over to Dominique to uh, manage uh, one or two questions if we can. And I'll certainly be able to uh, chat with Chris about a couple of areas in which it would be great to have uh, further scientific work done. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Cooper and Professor Shorat, for your talks and for presenting the results of the this, uh, DEXA uh, quality this survey on DEXA quality services and for presenting an overview of the activities of the two societies. Now I would like to move on to questions. And maybe uh, there is one very technical one on, on um, DEXA. Um, Professor Schwartz, would you like to uh, try to respond to this one? Somebody sure. is asking, uh, is mentioning that the, de the DEXA scan in um, his hospital is uh, re really of, uh, routinely, sorry, overcalling the FRAC scores. So this person has started to calculate it uh, himself. He's mm -hmm. asking whether this is common and how he should solve this problem? Uh, well, I, I don't know how common it is. Um, I, I don't know that we have much in the way of data that tells us about errors in FRAX calculation. A couple of aspects that I can think of immediately would be um, if the uh, FRAX score at the facility uh, is being calculated with the machine software. so most machines now calculate FRAX automatically with the inputting of questionnaire data. Um, it's possible that FRAX version on the machine is an older version of FRAX um, and that the FRAX version, of course, that's probably being used on the on the website, the Sheffield website, is uh, up to date. So, so that would be one thing that I would be I, I agree I agree just on the, on that point um yeah. with every month that goes by the routine data that populate FRAX in terms of the incidence rates of fracture particularly hip and major osteoporotic fracture and the mortality rates for that country are being increased country by country so in the past extrapolations have had to be made based on the ratio of age-adjusted hip fracture incidence in women between, say, the gold standard country, for example, Sweden, and any other comparator country in which we don't have incidence rates. Right. As time has gone on, those country-by-country country data have been populated, and so the FRAX of the, of the older software, which I completely agree, Chris, this, that's the likeliest reason for it, um, might have been introduced after the instrument was bought. 
Uh, but of course, it's also uh, completely easy to drop a note into to Neon, to you, Dominique, perhaps, and we can we can actually have a look uh, in specific terms at what the overestimation seems to be uh, derived from. The only other uh, thing that I, I I could think of would be the difference in ascertainment of clinical risk factors um, in in a in a facility where they're they're doing radiology testing versus the clinician's ascertainment of clinical risk factors and how that might change the FRAX output even with the same version of FRAX. So, so that would be another possibility in this circumstance. Thank you. There is another question. Um, um, so the person is asking um, that to the fact that if you want to impose the strict use of LSC, do you think that advisory local radiation regulatory bodies might be helpful? Uh, so I'll, I'll take this to start if I can, Cyrus. I think absolutely. We, what, what, what I think if, if you look at the positions uh, and particularly the position papers from ISCD, we state that, that, that local authority and local regulation um, always needs to be considered uh, very uh, importantly in any decisions to um, make choices like performing least significant change values. For instance, in the United States, there are some jurisdictions, some state jurisdictions that do not allow LSC uh, because it is not considered a quality assurance um, tool in the eyes of those uh, local jurisdictions. It is considered, a, um, it's considered an experiment and can't be done without uh, IRB approval. Uh, and specific order. So those jurisdictions must exist in other places in the world and, and you definitely need to defer to those. The question about what you do in that circumstance is very difficult to answer and, and, and ISCD and, and as, as a practical matter, I myself don't have a good answer for what to do if you are prohibited from doing LSC because of a law uh, or another jurisdictional issue. No, I agree. I agree that that's uh, that, that 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 is difficult. The, the 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 question, well, the discussion item I was going to have was um, looking back at your cross calibration hub and spoke thing for when the instruments are different for LSC. And what approach did you have there for for you know you, it wasn't the main subject. The main subject of the of the PDC was uh, the position paper was the was what you do about the actual measured DXA values. But when right. you are looking at rates of change in individuals in yeah. separate instruments, what yeah. approach to calibration can you can you utilize? What was the philosophy of that that you, your committee covered? Right. So when it comes to the instruments, the, the instruments are similar. Uh, technology instruments can be calibrated to each other without an in vivo cross calibration. So they can be calibrated with a phantom. What you're right, uh, the, the last point in the in the uh, slide uh, was that that tells you nothing about what you should do about the LSC between machines, right? So patient on machine A with LSC A, patient on machine B that is cross calibrated and may or may not use the same technologists right at a, at a different location what to do about that lsc there is a pretty good paper in the literature from a few years ago uh, john shepherd um, and sarah morgan published a paper on right. uh, a, a, a technique called generalized least significant change that really only um, uh, works between two different machines regarding hub and spoke model and multiple machines calibrated to a central machine there are a number of ways that you might approach lsc you could, uh, among the technologists that are using those machines, use the worst precision and LSC available uh, between the machines. You could you do an average, although mathematically, I'm not sure if, if that's the right thing to do. I don't think anybody knows. Um, both techniques um, have some advantages and disadvantages. And I think yeah. as long as you establish something that's cogent and makes sense for your hub and spoke model for LSC, uh, I think you're thinking about the problem, and and that's yeah. more important than not thinking about the problem. I I agree, it, I, absolutely. That considering the problem and thinking about um, uh, that when you're in the gray zone, you're not certain of a delta being really relevant or not. That that's Correct. the important point. But the science underpinning quite what you do about standardization 
is 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 interesting. Thank you. I've, I've, it's very thought provoking. That thanks. Yeah. Yes. Um, okay. Thank you. Uh, there is another question um, about uh, the city-based attenuation with the HU and the cutoff value. If you could explain a bit the steps, how to utilize utilize this uh, methodology. Sure. Uh, Cyrus, do you use do you use CT-based attenuation at all? Have you used it at all or no? Uh, we, we've we've used no. I mean, we've we've we use high-resolution PQCT in our research studies, and right. every now and again, wh where there have been particular aspects, say for example, bilateral hip replacements with a degenerative disease in the spine, and we're not really sure what's going on at the, right. the, with just the distal forearm. We 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 do clinically use. Um, HRPQCT to 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 look even in in the odd clinical subject, but for CT attenuation, no. I'm I'm interested in what okay. you have to say. Yeah. So this is this is a technique that utilizes standard clinical CT to garner opportunistically information that relates to the probability of osteoporosis. It can be used. There are a number of papers in the literature. If you go to the the specific citation. Uh, for the uh, for the HU paper from the PDC, um, that, that's a really good place to start um, in the orthopedic um, section of that paper. Um, uh, Perry Picard and uh, Professor Binkley have done a lot of work in this regard at the University of Wisconsin. It's a technique that utilizes the attenuation measurement tool in standard CT image processing systems to estimate the probability of osteoporosis. And it's in short. Um, it, you can use an axial or a sagittal section of any one of the bones from T12 to L4, although L1 is preferred. And you go to the mid position of the bone. You place a, 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 a region of interest inside of the vertebral body, either in the sagittal section or the axial section. And the value that's uh, obtained from circular or elliptical section helps estimate the probability of osteoporosis in the bone. The cutoffs that were arrived at based on the modest spread in the literature are these. At or below 100 HU of attenuation at the L1 position, there is a 90% probability of osteoporosis. Um, and so that's quite valuable for uh, patients, well, really the, the numbers are 90, there's a 90% specificity for osteoporosis at 100 HU and a 90% sensitivity for osteoporosis at 150 HU. So the, the, the technique can be used to estimate the probability of osteoporosis. It's very useful in patients who have pre-existing lumbar degenerative disease um, or other artifacts that you know are influencing the densitometry but can't quite get to it. And it's fast, it doesn't require an additional test, it's not radiation-based, it does not determine T-score osteoporosis, but it helps put you in the ballpark, and I think is a ready way for other colleagues not directly interested in bone and bone metabolism to have access to some measures that give them a sense, particularly our orthopedic colleagues and, and spinal surgery colleagues, which is why that particular technique was included in that portion of the PDC. I mean, I think that the um, I think that for for the uh, for the kind of clinicians here in the UK, the systems that actually routinely assess vertebral morphometry from um, CT images and so almost sort of uh, uh, discern uh, vertebral fractures that might be there but just undiagnosed in all the routine uh, examinations that are done for non-skeletal indications. Um, are probably the biggest anthology of CT images that are that are, that are obtained, and I guess you could you could apply it wherever a, a, an area of spine has is available in those sorts of images as well. And I just haven't I haven't seen that. I, I'll talk to Neil about about whether how adaptable it is. Do you do you know? Can you use those routine CT images to yes. to look? Yeah, that's yeah. that's exactly it. This is opportunistic. So CT of the abdomen, CT of yeah. the chest. Right, uh, KUBCT for kidney stones, all with or without contrast. Contrast really only influences the measure by about 10 Hounsfield units, so it never, almost never, really reclassifies patients that much. Um, yes, any of those can be used opportunistically. You know, I typically um, will will um, utilize a CT that's 
no more than a year old to get a sense. Um, but but that's the that is one of the points here is that it, you can jump into a CT that was created for another purpose and garner information that's useful for bone strength. Great, lovely. Thank well, you. Thank you, Dominique. I think um, you've done very well there. Well done. Thank you, Dominique. Thank you. Yeah. So I think uh, I would like to thank you very much for your participation in this webinar and uh, we hope that you enjoy this session. We will post the recording on this webinar on the IWEF website and you will also receive the link by email tomorrow. And uh, right after this webinar, you will be prompted to fill in a survey. Uh, we would appreciate your input and your comments as we continuously try to deliver webinars that meet your needs. Last but not the least, I, if you have any question, comments, please do not hesitate to send them over to webinar at iofbonehealth.org. And uh, I would like to thank once again Professor Cooper and Schwartz for the excellent talks. And I would like to say goodbye to everyone and uh, see you maybe um, next month. Bye bye and have a good day or a nice evening, everyone. Good evening. Bye bye now. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye.